let's get this show on the road. Uh, welcome back uh, to the first, in many ways, first full-blown uh, lecture of this lecture series, Entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship Through an Interdisciplinary Lens. Today we have our first, like I said, full-blown lecture by our first guest lecturer, uh, Ben Habiba. He's with us here today as uh, really someone who works at the intersection of entrepreneurship scholarship on the one hand, so as an intersection between university, academia, and entrepreneurial practice. He's uh, the director of the Center for Knowledge and Innovation Transfer, and also the executive director for the Center for Entrepreneurship and Applied Business Studies. So he's really, when you look for someone who's kind of at the pulse of entrepreneurial activity in Graz and in the surrounding area, he's one of the people uh, you need to talk to, and he's, he's got He's got the connections, right? So that's why we figured, I mean, the Center for Entrepreneurship and Applied Business Studies is also an official partner of our project. So it uh, only made sense to invite them uh, to, uh, to be a partner and collaborate uh, because there's a lot of expertise and know-how and they're in of the, of the academy and we'll try to be part of that. Um, yes, that's basically it in terms of an introduction. Ben had said like, you. we'll, uh, we'll uh, say a few words and then um, she's yeah. on yours. Thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Just uh, to clarify something, I'm director of the Center for Knowledge and Innovation Transfer, uh, and I'm happy that I was a part of the Center for Entrepreneurship, but I'm not the director there. This is Professor Kutschlofer, so, uh, but we are working closely together, and uh, um, entrepreneurship is all about cooperation and working together. So. Uh, Thank you for coming to this lecture and for organizing this. Uh, I will try to give you some insights and my point of view on entrepreneurship and how I can fill up this, this title. It's all about people because that's what I think when it comes to entrepreneurship. And uh, I prepared some slides and want to show you some of my experiences with that. And just uh, for the start, if you have any question, if you want to discuss something in more in detail, please interrupt me. We can do this. So I have 337 slides, <laughs> so we can talk the whole evening. Uh, but uh, if you have any specific question, please uh, feel free to interrupt me. And I will talk about uh, the topic from the angle of, of people, because I have to, a lot of to do with different people and my thing, way of thinking of entrepreneurship that, of course, you have ideas and technologies and so on, but the people, hello, uh, making entrepreneurship living. So to start with my person, uh, uh, my name is Bernhard Weber. Here are my email address. So if you want to contact me, uh, please feel free. If you have any further question or you want to start your own company, a startup, please feel free to contact me because I have different roles in the startup ecosystem here uh, in the academic world in Graz. My main role is that I'm uh, building up the Center for Knowledge and Innovation Transfer, which is physically seen is, is the construction site behind the Mensa between Lech, Gas and Schubertstraße. We're building a new center, which I can explain later on. I'm also part of Gründungsgarage and I'm part of the Center for Entrepreneurship here on the University of Graz. So uh, I do this uh, because it's my passion. And my passion is that I help young projects to grow up into startups and I do this since 2006. So a lot of startups here in the local ecosystems uh, were part of my, my work. So I helped, for example, those uh, teams to, to start their companies. I hope you, you know some of the logos, the most of them are somehow connected to university research or, or something like that, uh, because that's uh, where I am at home. And that's my mission in all those roles is to help uh, research and researchers and students to transfer their know-how into companies. We call it spin-offs, so it's a uh, my favorite role is to, to help uh, to grow spin-offs, uh, which is, let's say, a special part of, of startup business, it's the university spin-offs out of the uh, university research. So this is my mission. And I told you that I'm responsible for the Center for Knowledge and Innovation Transfer, and I just brought a picture of that. This is the rendering uh, from, the, from our architects, and this is how it will look by the end of next year in Schubertstraße 
number six. Uh, maybe you know this the former building of the uh, ÖH, uh, the, the, the villa uh, will be part of the center. There will be two uh, stages. There will be a, a nice co-working space in the villa and we have a new office building behind where we can offer space for, for young companies, for startups and we offer space and services. And, and we try to build up, we call it a hub for innovators, direct on the campus, perfect infrastructure where the, the brains from the campus can uh, connect with entrepreneurs, with corporates. We will have a lovely coffee shop on, in our building so where you can communicate uh, with uh, uh, bright, bright minds, I would say. We'll have a platform on, for spin-off startups, investors, <coughs> corporates, so our goal is to have a place direct on the campus, not somewhere in the, in the, uh, somewhere in the city, but on the campus where all those groups which are involved in innovation, startup and science can, can mix together and hopefully be productive to build new projects, new companies, and so on. So uh, this is how it looks like uh, actually. Uh, we, this is a picture from the opening of the, of the, of the construction site with our partners from the Politik and Vice Rector Peter Riedler. We, uh, he's my partner in the ZB, in the Center for Knowledge and Innovation Transfer. And now we're digging a hole and then we, <laughs> we build up uh, a nice building. Everything is running smooth, so uh, hope you, you don't have problems with traffic, uh, with the bus or so, when, we, when the, we have big machines moving on. But we are really happy that we can start, that we had started the, the, the thing in the May, I think. And uh, if everything goes right, we'll start by the end of next year. And this is how it will look like. Uh, I show a lot of slides about that because I love that. Uh, this will be the, the villa where the co-working space will be located. We have the coffee shop here and, and the, the office building here. So it, everything will come together and we'll have a nice conference deck which can be used, for example, for lectures like this uh, on, on the roof uh, top of the, of the villa. So it will be a really nice uh, place to be inspired to start your own projects. And another uh, project I'm involved, which is also very important, I think, so that you should know about it, is the Gründungsgarage, which is an accelerator program for academic startups. We started some uh, five years ago here on the Center for Entrepreneurship. Then we cooperate with the Graz uh, University of Technology, and, and since then we do it together. We uh, have uh, two uh, volumes, we call it per year, where we are uh, looking for 10 projects we support for three months uh, during the semester in, with mentorship, with workshops, with know-how transfer, and we want to, to push young uh, startup projects out of the academic area to make their first steps. So it's a accelerator, very early stage accelerator program where we are looking for entrepreneurial minds on the campus. And at the end of every uh, uh, volume, we have this final pitching event where we have a lot of uh, nice faces on it. But this is the final of last volume where uh, we have the winners made the best presentations, they win uh, good prizes and they win the motivation to, to go the next steps uh, to build up the company. Uh, just look at the website, uh, gründungsgarage.at. And actually, I can offer something we are looking for, for help. We are, we are offering two jobs, actually, for the Grunings Garage. We will professionalize the thing a little bit. Uh, so we're looking for operations manager, or something like that, 30 hours per week, and uh, uh, an assistant. So because the thing is running very smooth, so we need some help because we all, the team, we all do this like, like in our free time, so <laughs> so now we are grown up, we need some help. So if you are interested, just look at our website tomorrow because I just phoned with my colleague, he put up the job offers in the, during the night. So so that's what I'm doing uh, uh, on my, in, in my job and in my professional life. And I think we should talk about uh, uh, what's innovation, what's entrepreneurship, what are we talking about? 
Um, and I think I, I, we should invite someone who can talk really good about that. He's very experienced. So we have a short video from a real entrepreneur who has a lot of experience and he tells a little bit about his uh, life as an entrepreneur and his experiences. Yeah, it's fascinating, said the lieber Richard Branson. Oh, sorry, I, have to switch. I, I did this uh, uh, speech so often in German, so I have to switch in English. Uh, Richard Branson basically said everything you had to know about, so we can stop the lecture here. Uh, so he, he made really some uh, good insights. It's, it's fascinating. Uh, it's you are sailing on this dividing line between success and failure. So uh, that, that are things we, we often see and we often hear from entrepreneurs. What we also have to, to uh, look at is on innovation. We always talk about, I work with startups, so this is the entrepreneurship. The other thing is the innovation. And uh, last week we had a, a guest lecturer here uh, on the university, a colleague from, from, the, uh, from Germany, and he put on some very good slides that can document what innovation means. So I stole those slides from him uh, to, to bring you a, a visualization of, of how the, the speed of innovation can change uh, the life and, and how entrepreneurs can influence that. So this is a picture of New York, the Fifth Avenue, um, and uh, around 1900. And you see a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, horses on the Fifth Avenue. The question is, where is the car? Uh, if you look really close, you will see the car here. So there's one car on the crowded Fifth Avenue, um, which was the normal thing around that time in New York. And if you just go uh, some years into the future, 1930, the same streets, uh, you see more or less just cars on the streets and you have to look very closely to find, uh, to find the, the, the horse on the streets. Um, so there is uh, a dramatic change uh, in this landscape because uh, a company, Ford Motor Company, made an innovation and they, they, they invented this, the way to produce the cars uh, and they changed dramatically uh, the, the way mobility was done in the city and, and uh, influences mobility since then. We see it in every day on our streets. So that's what innovation is about. Or another nice picture to symbolize this is, is this one, you see this is uh, Pope Benedict's <coughs> inauguration 2005. Nice picture in, in the Vatican. You see all those people waiting with the, the doors open and so the Pope uh, will come out of the, uh, on the street. 2005 it looks like this and in 2030 it looks like, like that when Pope Francis' inauguration was going on. So you also see a dramatic change of the behavior of the of the people, there is a new innovation technology on the picture and it looks, you see this nowadays in every concert and so you don't see the musicians, you just see the screens of the, of the smartphones. So it's also something uh, that documents the, 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 what innovation can do uh, and, and in all those innovations there are entrepreneurs uh, involved and uh, we all, always talk from about disruptive innovations uh, and most of the time they come from outside the market. So um, uh, there were a lot of dis disruptive innovation like the printing press, uh, horseless carriage, the, the ultimate tool, or music, digital music distribu distribution or Uber is something like a, like a role model for disruption uh, nowadays and it also always was not the, the disruption always doesn't come from inside of the of the business. There, there was some outside uh, influence who, which combines with the with the problem on the market and doing disruption uh, and and in some cases destroys an old technology or market and build up a new technology. So that's innovation, which is in most of the cases uh, the, the 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 driving force of, of entrepreneurship which is re really nice to see in this visualization. I like that and, and also the, the New York example because it makes really visible what happens in a relatively short time frame uh, to, to all those people. 
and in Creative Safari it was normal to, to make a picture, to upload uh, the picture. And also this shows, this is also the, 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 the end of 120 year old company like Kodak. Uh, so they missed totally this point of the innovation. They, they were the holy grail of photography and they invented digital photography uh, uh, historically, but they, the management say, oh, this is not interesting. So who want to make photo digitally? That doesn't work. So uh, this was a little bit of a mistake. So this big company went down and is now out of the market uh, after I think 120 years of being in business. And they did the invention of the digital uh, photograph technology, but didn't see the potential in it. That's also a thing uh, which is part of innovation processes. So when it comes to, to the, the main title of, of my um, lecture, it's, a, it's, it's all about people. We saw a lot about the, the technology and companies and so, but I think the main force of entrepreneurship, of entrepreneurial behavior is, is are the people behind and I'm very active in the startup business, so you, I always see all those, those great examples for entrepreneurs. When you look in, in our blogs and news uh, sites, for example, people like, like Elon Musk is a kind of a role model for disruption and entrepreneurship, and a little bit of crazy person doing a lot of <coughs> things. Uh, I do not say that everything's positive, but this is, is, is a, as a role model for entrepreneurship. Also, maybe you know this guy, uh, Adam Newman. Uh, he is or he was CEO of a company called WeWork, uh, which is a hype story of a startup in the United States. Uh, billions of valuation. They want to go, want to make an IPO in the last weeks. And the thing is that they have to to stop the IPO because the story was, I would, it was a more or less what it is. 80% of the valuation is more or less a, a hot air valuation, I would call it. And it's because of, of the person, because Adam Newman was, is such a charismatic person with all those, those personalities like, like Elon Musk or Donald Trump and, and they, 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 they are fascinating for most of the people, that the investors and all believe in the story, which some people, including me, thought, hey, they're doing just co-working spaces at the end in different places on the world. And as I'm built up a co-working space, I know this is a very, very thin margin business. And I'm always wondering how you can build up such a high valuation company based on, at the end, on, on a I mean, very innovative, very leading form of, of new work places, but uh, okay. But it was the, the person who was very, very, uh, very special one. And, uh, and he it was mainly the, the whole point of the story, why investors put money in, in the company. And uh, the Persons, the founders also influence uh, very strongly how the, the company is, how the image of the company uh, is, is uh, uh, recognized by, by all of us. For example, this is, uh, you know, I, I think you know Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, and these are the founders of, of Google, and, and those are very dominating person in this United States uh, startup business. and. The, the, the Google founders are very nerdy technicians and, and so the company is, the Mark Zuckerberg is more market oriented. So Facebook was, for my opinion, from the very beginning more oriented on, 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 on social marketing and all those stuff. So those people behind or this founding person also uh, influence uh, the way how a company is how the image of a company or how, how the DNA of a company is, is uh, set up from the beginning. These are the great uh, startup people we all know from all those uh, Silicon Valley stories, but they're also uh, 
a lot of nice teams here in Graz, for example, I work with, or I work with and work with. For example, this is a team of bike citizens. They're doing a, a software for urban cyclists, I would call it. So they optimize the way you can use a bicycle in, in, the, in the urban regions with navigation and other services. So we, well, we talk later about the two founders. They are very special and they had the, the mission to, to build up uh, uh, this company I will talk later on, or a classic science spin-off, also a totally different type of people behind the company is Innofor, which is a spin-off here of the University of Graz. They're sitting just around the corner here. They're doing, a, um, uh, they're developing software to discover enzymes uh, to, to make in a nutshell, and they are researchers by heart and they started to build a company. So they are not the, not the, the, the uh, Elon Musk type of people. They are very, they are really good brains and, and they have a vision of their product. And, but they do it in their way. They, it would not possible to build up a company like Innofor when you are uh, like Adam Newman from WeWork because that wouldn't fit together. And they're also, luckily there are teams <laughs> like like those two founders of uh, QualiSign. It's also a spin-off I, I helped to start 10 years ago or nine years ago. So also two researchers, they are representing other type of founders because they are like a role model of female founder, they call them, because they are very good researchers. They started the companies and they, together they have seven childs, so she has four and she has three child, so they did it really hard way, founded a company and families nearly in the same <laughs> time, so it is worth to talk with, with those two uh, ladies. Uh, you can learn a lot about how to handle your life uh, in a very exciting times. <laughs> so, but you see there are a lot of different phases behind the companies and those different people and persons, they influence really the way how, uh, how a company works. Why is this so? Um, I think there are, when you, when you look at what is important for a startup or, or, or for a company who started, I, I try to figure out some lesson I learned from all those 150 plus startups I mentored since 2006, which are more or less main points you have to consider, have in your mind, and at the end, from my point of view, everything at this point has to do with, not with technology and innovation, but with the people behind it. And for me, the, I would say the, the most important point uh, when it comes to start your own, your own business, your own company, is uh, that you have to follow your, your passion. So just, you cannot start an, an, an venture or a project or whatever if it's the most boring thing you can imagine in your life, so that will not work out, even if you, you know you can earn a lot of money with that. So I think the better way is to follow your passion and, and I think when you make a big research and make it statistically right, you will find out that the most successful projects are those who are, where the people are following the path of passion, I would call it. So at the end, uh, when you start a, a startup, at the end you always, staying on a stage, having a bottle of champagne in the hand. So that's the life of a startup founder, basically. Uh, but uh, if you win something, if they're excited and, and it's, it's the, the field of your passion, you, you are really lucky. Uh, you're really lucky. And that's, also, that's the way they did it. Daniel and Andreas, uh, they were really, they are, passionate about cycling in the city. They, they are cycling in every part of the world, in every city of the world. And they always thought, why do all those people in the cars have perfect navigation software in the cars integrated? And, and why do all those thousands of, of uh, bicycle, uh, bicycles on the streets of the cities don't have the right tools for doing that? the time when they started the company, if you use a Charmin or, or, or Google Maps navigation system and they're using a bicycle, you will 
I mean, you will find the way, but it will not be the optimal way for you to, to cycle through, I don't know, Budapest or so. Maybe you were routed on a, on a big street with thousands of cars and you don't know that just 10 meters on the left and the right side, there is a, a small little street without any car and you can use this. So they, they thought about this problem because uh, they, they are living the, with, with, the, with the bicycles. 24 hours, so uh, they thought about that had to be changed, and but they thought, okay, we are not the software engineers, we don't know how to, to develop an app, we don't know anything about those business, but we know what the cyclists need in the, in the city. So that's that's their starting point. And, and that was the right way because they, they had a lot of troubles, of course, but they they talked a lot about their project and I found an, a software engineer who was also, uh, they said, hey, great idea, I will jump into your company and they start this. So they had the first problem solved. They had someone who can develop an Android app. <laughs> uh, and the, the, all the other stuff they learned because it was the field of their passion. So that's, that's really, really important. And now they are, I think they have 25 employees here in Graz, they're just looking for a new office. If you know someone who has 400 square meters of office somewhere in the city, uh, near Landplatz, they would uh, love, but uh, I can give you the context details. <laughs> Actually, they, they're a grown-up company now, um, in the middle age of a, of a, of a startup life. Uh, they, they earn money and they try to expand. Um, uh, and they really had really hard times in the last years, but they always found some solution because it is their passion to, to help cities to bring more bicycles on the streets. That's the energy, they, they harvest the energy from that. So that's a, the, the passion thing, which is, for me, it, it's really the most important thing because every other thing ba is based on that. The second thing is, I think you have to de develop a vision uh, so, so developing a vision is not something for corporates with hiring consultants to help to build up the vision. I think a vision should be, should every small startup should start at least somehow in the first uh, weeks or, or months of their, of, their, of their journey of the startup, they should develop a vision because uh, of when you start a company, it's, everything is exciting. You start to, to, for example, writing code or developing some hardware or something like that, and everything is nice. But uh, a vision, you need a vision because you, you have to know the rough direction where to go. And if you don't know where to go, you, 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 one day you go in this direction, one day you go in this direction, and you don't have enough resources to find out all those ways. This is very important also for, for small startups and it's, 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 it's the glue which, which bring the team together. So if you are two or three people and you're talking about your, your, your vision, you can be sure that every, and my, I will say to startups, please write it down, travel to, to the wine yards of South Syria, drink a good glass of wine, talk about the vision, write it on a paper and everyone should sign it because then you, are really sure that you are, everyone is talking about the same thing be, because one source of trouble for startups that you just talking on the surface level about your vision and you say, oh yeah, we want to start a, a growing company. And one founder means we want to start a fast growing company and sell them after three weeks. The other one, yeah, we want to start a growing company which organically grows and then I will put it, hand it over to my son or something like that. So both talking about growth, but they are talking about different planets of growth. So therefore you have to talk and, and write down and build a vision. And if everyone in the team has the same vision, you don't have to talk on daily basis for on every operation and detail because you can be sure everyone works in the same direction. I mean, on starting you have a very broad street because you, you drive like this, but basically you go in the same direction. For example, a team we, we, we have in Grünitz garage actually is, is Freisheim. They, uh, they are working on urban or, or on outdoor uh, clothes 
So, and their vision is to build up the first brand uh, for for uh, for uh, outdoor shows who are really in the circular economy. So they want to build up uh, jackets and so on with materials and all, all the logistics around that that you can repair it, which is really in this in this sense of circular economy, not just talk about, but really build it. So the basically you should use as long as possible your jacket when you go hiking or, or skiing. And after, I don't know, two times, three times repairing it and it's really out of, of, of the time, then you can put it on the, on the, on the, on the compost and, and it will be great. So that's, that's, their, that's, their, that's their vision and that's the team behind. Uh, and they're really, they're really into the, into the vision. They're really thinking and working every on daily basis on, on uh, to go in this direction. And they, they are, they have, this is a, a good team because Jan is also founder of Makava. So, so he has a 10 year history of, of, of founding a suc now successful company and they are chemists uh, or experts from materials in the, in the team. Uh, so they have the know-how, but they all share the same vision. They they want to revolutionize this this, this industry, not just not just talking about being uh, in a circular economy or, or, but doing it in really in real life. So that's their, their vision. It's really long-term goal because they have to they start with products now, but they have to develop own materials and so on. So it's a really really long-term goal, but. It's it fits with the vision. They have, to, they have to like ten years vision and the, the sun somewhere, uh, and that's that you need because uh, they will have really troubles every on daily, on weekly, on monthly basis. So therefore, you need the vision which gives you energy and say, okay, today we had a really bad talk with an investor, or with a partner, or something like that. But okay, we see the vision. We want to build up this this great company. So therefore, a vision is is yeah, it's really one of the most important ingredients for a successful startup. And the third one is is something which, for me, it's it's really important to know because we're living in a, in a very uh, in, a, in a world where you have you you see and read and uh, a lot of stories about startup stories and exits and hundreds of millions of dollars they earn because they sold the company to Google or Facebook or you name it. Uh, and you always think, wow, they started like three weeks ago at the student dorm. The company started to, to code a, a software or an app and after three months, Sergey Brin from Google knocked on the door and, and I write the check and then they reach. So that's a little bit, uh, I mean, in this direction that uh, all those success story are uh, broadcasters in the media, but uh, at the end, behind all those overnight success stories are hundreds and thousands of nights <laughs> you don't see in, in those success stories. So you have to be prepared for that. So there are no overnight success stories. So that's basically something which is not overnight success story, you just see the last night and not the night before. So. And for a uh, good example is, is Polysime. Uh, Eva and Andrea, I mentioned uh, as a team uh, before, they, I had them in an idea competition, I think 2008, uh, they presented their idea uh, of uh, making a, a system for to diagnose mount infection. So they were researchers on the TU and here on the Kalpansi University. And we began to talk about that. We became a nice idea to start a company out of it, to make the product and start a company. And in 2009, they decided really to go out of their science career tracks and go into the company. And you see 2009, now it's 2019, and I talked to them uh, yesterday because they won a prize on Tuesday, I think. This is a picture from this week. They won the Phoenix uh, Founders Prize from, from AWS uh, for their project, uh, which was nice. Uh, and they, they are really sure that they can 
they will have product launch in next year, so third quarter next year, 2020. So you see, they started 2009, we'll start the product uh, next year, more than 10 years of research and developments uh, for this. I mean, it's a, it's a medicine product, so you have to do a lot of things to put such a product in the market, but you have to real, be really convinced about your vision, your way, your product, your know-how, and your ability to, to bring this all in street to survive 10 years before you have a real product in your hand you can sell to, to customers. But uh, I mean, the most of the, the founders said, oh, if you have told me at the beginning that it's such a hard way, we'll have never started this, this thing. So you have to, I have to be very careful to, to tell really what it's about to start a, a medtech company, for example, because it's, it's really hard. But if you have a vision, if, you, if it's your passion, the field uh, we're working, it's, it's able to, to do something. But uh, you have to really be sure that you uh, know that it's really a marathon. Uh, you have to start and not a not 100 meter sprint. Okay. And then the good thing is there are a lot of people around in the world which uh, can help you. So the first point is you do, that you have to find support. Uh, you have to look for support to find it. Uh, uh, and this is for me also really important points. First thing is if you start as a single founder, as a, as a one person idea, venture, my advice is to reach out on the streets and look for a co-founder. So it's always nicer to start something uh, as a team. Uh, I mean, most of the time, maybe it's, it's your idea, you started it, but, and you can make the first step alone, but there's that many reasons to, to looking for a co-founder that you have to do it because you need something to talk with, you need, if you are talking, if you are in the United States talking to an investor, somebody is here and can work on the company, you can share experience and risk and fears and everything. Uh, so it's really important and it's a hard thing. So how do you find a co-founder? <laughs> that's, that's like, yeah, you can, I mean, just, uh, you can go to uh, Elizabeth Despira or to, to to uh, the, the TV show to find something. Uh, but the, the thing is you have to talk about your passion and, and uh, go out, go on parties and tell everyone who wants to hear it and who don't want to hear it, what you're doing. And you have to yeah, fi find out who, or, or make offers. It, there's no single way to find a co-founder. So you have to try it to set up team constellation or projects where you can try how you can work together. Maybe set up a, a two months period where you just work on a project basis together because uh, founding a company together is, is like you getting married. Uh, it's harder than you get married because you are bringing more time together with the co-founder than with your wife or your, that's, that's it's really important to, to be really sure to find something who, who really a fit on the, on, the, on the personal level. So that's, that's the thing I would really advise you to not start as a, when you start really a company which will grow, it's better to do it not alone. I mean, I also had startups who started like a team of five or six, so that's tricky. So the best way would be if you're a team of two or three. So uh, that's the way you can communicate together. It's not too complicated to set up agreements together. And, and, and if you have five co-founders, uh, it's like, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult. So two or three will be good. Four or five or more is difficult. So rule of thumb, but not do it alone. Do it. The next thing is you have the co-founder. Uh, Really, really good is to, to find some people who, are, who can help you with their advice, mentors. Um, and there are a lot of people out there in the world who are really happy to help a young project who wants 
they don't want to earn money, they just want to share the experience and, and uh, you will be really uh, surprised how, let's say, easy it is to find and if you are able to communicate your product, if you are not a total crazy person, uh, you will find someone who is experienced in the field you're looking for just to drink a coffee every month and talk about what you're doing, what you have, uh, what are the next steps and, and get some advice. I mean, you can, if you have Hansi, for example, as, as mentor, this would be uh, like a lucky bunch. He's the best known business angel here in Austria. Everyone wants to him that his, uh, his experience, everyone wants to have him as, in, in, as a business angel in his team, but, or, or uh, Selma or Lisa. So those are all people. I can just go outside, go in the company, you know, and ask the CEO, uh, or I'm sure you know the right people, you just have to ask. So it's really important to build up a, let's say, a, a network of mentors uh, that you, you have the people in your network, you can talk on a regular basis and you have their phone number if there is, for example, a crisis, if you have, oh fuck, we are running out of money and I don't know what to do. It's good to have the number of, of Hansi in your phone book. If I don't want the money, <coughs> but give me some advice, what should I do? to do and if you start to build up that networks when you are in the crisis it's too late so you have to start from the very first beginning. So we do for example mentoring programs in the Gründungsgarage and every good startup supporting program has some mentoring aspects in it. And it's al always good to talk to people who have seen something on the business, on the world, uh, to pitch them your project, to listen to them, what they're thinking about it. Uh, that's, that's a really really good way to, and in some projects they are, if you are a, a single founder, maybe it is, they are kind of a co-founder if you don't have a, a, a co-founder in a team for, for a, a part of the time. Yeah, surprisingly also the university can, can help you uh, um, when you start a company, um, so they are always uh, some organization around there, for example, here in the University of Graz, you have the Gründungsgarage, for example, or the Center for Knowledge and Innovation Transfer, or the Technology Transfer Office. So there are also uh, people who are paid to help you on the, somewhere on the campus. Uh, I hope it's not so, so hard to find them, me for example, but the University of Graz and every modern university tries uh, uh, or, or should be sure that there is uh, some entrepreneurial spirit on the campus because it's from my point of view it's very important to have an entrepreneurial ecosystem on the campus and around it to, to have an attractive um, working surrounding for, for students, for researchers, for employees of the university. Uh, so nearly every university in Europe I would say has something like an accelerator program like Gründungsgarage we built up or a center like this that we, where you can have infrastructure and support. So just ask the university, go into lectures like this. So you have already done the first step uh, and you will find some support. And, and uh, all those people who are working in, in, in organizations like, like ours, they are happy to, to help you. Uh, so try to find them. So you are University of Graz, you are happy to have these supporters here on the campus. The good thing in Austria and Europe, or especially in, in Austria, is that there's a lot of public money for entrepreneurs uh, out there. Uh, so public funding is the main source of financing for, for startups in the first, in the first uh, one to three years, I would say, uh, in, in Austria. So uh, it would be good to, to take a look at all those funding agencies. It's a little bit complex situation, but if you have to invest a little bit of time to understand all those stuff. But basically, we in Austria, so there's a Styrian funding uh, agency, the SFG. Uh, they offer some programs. The main programs uh, are the Austrian-wide programs from SFG the, uh, and the Austrian uh, AWS. Uh, those are the two, two agencies of really 
the best um, funding programs for innovation and entrepreneurs in their programs. So, and they have a lot of information. You have to do it, go to their organization, to their websites. And uh, they've really, they are really helpful. They not just offer money. They also have some mentoring programs or some expertise in their uh, programs. But they, they can be the, the key to the first, to the first money you need. And also the European Union, don't forget uh, them. They have their, their big framework programs with 110 billion of euros. And the part of them, the, the European Union invests in, in innovation and therefore also in startups. So there's the European Innovation Council. They have some programs uh, to support SMEs, uh, small media enterprises and uh, there are special programs for startups. Uh, I'm also part of, of some of the programs as evaluator, so there's a lot of money involved. They're very competitive, so because you compete with whole European startup ecosystem, but they're worth looking at it. So public funding is really good developed here in Austria. You, you, don't, you should not miss it, the public funding uh, opportunities here, and it can really help to make the first steps to make R&D to pay some university researchers to help you to develop the product or everything you have to do or develop the first prototype, uh, make some research. So public funding is, is very well developed here. And uh, another point where you can uh, build the first networks with smart peoples are public institutions like I just take out some of them which are very important here and local. These are cluster organizations like the Human Technology Cluster, Green Tech Cluster, Automotive Cluster, Creative Industries Cluster. They are clustering um, companies from their uh, specific industry together and they're really good points to, to go into very specific uh, networks. So they are having a lot of events. If you look at the website of like Human Technology of Zurich, for example, yesterday had a breakfast event at the Medical University uh, for scientists, uh, female scientists who want to uh, become entrepreneurs. Uh, so just look at the website, go to the events, they're really helpful. They, they are, well, they are paid by governmental money to build networks and help companies to, uh, to make contacts with, with local companies or also on international level, they, they're really helpful. So they are here to help you, so use the chance and and they're, but especially they like startups because they, their role is also to bring more new companies here on the place in their specific domain. So startups are one way of, of becoming new members in their, in their industry. So use it. And also the Chamber of Commerce, of course, uh, can, can help you. So there are a lot of public institutions. They're here to help you, but you have to to actively uh, go to them and, and ask for help because they cannot know whether you're sitting here and you're thinking about your ideas. Uh, and the good thing is there are a lot of them around <coughs> in the region. We, we made uh, this, this map uh, this year new for the whole startup ecosystem here in Graz. And there are of course all over Austria, a similar organization than in Europe. So there are Organizations can help you with ideas and business models. There are a lot of organizations who organize events. So there are 100 events uh, per year can help you to take contact with, with, uh, with, okay. I hope we have the power plug somewhere. But anyway, And there are, of course, co-working spaces. There are incubators, a lot around the al Alone here in Graz. There are incubators like private ones, 360 Lab, just around the corner, or the Science Bus, or AVL has an own incubator. So there are a lot of organizations. You just have to use this. There, I think there's a website you can find this on startupbarometer.com. So the thing is, the, the message is there are that much people around here in the area who can help you with your, with your startups. So, uh, and the good thing is 
we all know each other, so when you can do the uh, University of Applied Science, if I are Neom and you want help in a specific field, they will uh, give you the contact to the one. If they cannot answer a question, they will route you to the to the to the right person and to the right place. So because we are we are a small community, everyone knows each other, uh, and it's up to you to use this. And the fifth point is uh, when you start a company, it's about 100% commitments. Uh, so from my experience, I mean, you can start a little to make something entrepreneurial besides your daily work, of course, but if you want to build up a real company with, you want to grow on international level, it's about 100% commitment. You have to be very committed uh, to step out, for example, of your job, go in totally 100% in your own company uh, with all the advantages and disadvantages because if you step out of the jobs, there's no monthly payment <laughs> on, on your bank account. You have to see how you, you can uh, pay your rent and all that stuff. But you will come relatively quickly on that point that you have to go full into this uh, project. And it's like a, a good example is, is uh, the founders of uh, Studo, maybe you know this uh, student uh, uh, life organization app, I would call it. They are really 100% committed. Sometimes it's a, it's a real little bit uh, dangerous because you are so, it's your passion, you have a vision developed, you are so 100% fully committed that you, the dangerous thing is that you don't forget that you have also a kind of a normal life outside of your business uh, thing. But in the first years, it's more or less necessary to, to make your normal life, the, the entrepreneurial life, because you are the one who, who built up the company. And so you have to be very into your business, 100% commitment, working a lot of hours for your, for your project uh, and, and stay motivated, so uh, that's, the, that's the, the tricky thing that you have, you have to invest a lot of your time, of your personality, of, of your money, and stay uh, motivated, that's really important. Or a classic example which we always discuss is when you start a company out of science, which is a perfect source for, for building up good spin-off or startup companies that you, you, you use know how you develop in your, in your research as a researcher here in the university. And then you relatively fast, uh, you're reaching the point where you have to decide, okay, I cannot be part-time researchers and part-time uh, founder. So you have to decide to come on the dark side of the, of the earth. <laughs> uh, and that's a, that's a hard decision because uh, the thing is, uh, when you leave the, the researcher's path, it's really hard to go back because of the situation we have in the academic world here in, uh, in Austria. Uh, so uh, it's a hard decision. So maybe you have a postdoc uh, contract or you have maybe the chance to, to get uh, a long-term contract with the university. But if you want to make this spin up, you have a perfect technology like Thomas and Gunther developed this welding technology in their institute uh, in the Infeldgasse. They had to decide, okay, should we do this fully and ha take the chance and build up this company they call now Spurtech. They are really successful. Or if we want to stay researchers on the university, we cannot do it. So you have to decide. It's, it's, a, it's a hard decision. That's about 100% commitment. You have to take a risk. Uh, Maybe, uh, maybe in, in most of the cases, it's a kind of a one-way ticket. So, I mean, I would be the fan of, of uh, making both directions open so that you make a company, start a company, successful or not, it would be a good experience to bring back in, in the research, uh, but that we have to talk about with our colleagues from the lecturers. Uh, but, uh, Basically, you have to make the decision. It's, it doesn't help. And if even the first thing would be when you 
need money, you, you need an investor or also funding agency, they give you like 500,000 euro, they want to have you full time in your company. So they don't want to have you like 20 hours teaching and researching and then from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. being an entrepreneur that doesn't work out. So if you take the money, you have to go full in because otherwise it will not, will not work. So that's, that's what I mean about 100% commitment. You have to be really motivated to do this and you have to make this decision to, to do it. And of course, uh, when you start, at least when you start a startup, so a growing company, you have to think and act globally from the very first beginning because like Sturdeck, okay, they will find first customer maybe here because we have an automotive industry. They, I think they have Magna as customer and so, but their main market is, is not in Graz and not in Styria, and not in Austria, but on all the other parts of the world. So, so that's the way you have to think and act and that's also something we, we try to 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 help students to, to, to come in this in this mindset. Uh, for example, a company like a small company, now they are like 20 people, bionic surface technology. Uh, good example, they develop uh, surfaces uh, which are acting like uh, shark skins to, to optimize aerodynamics of, of surfaces. And uh, regularly they're doing research projects like, like that spread all over Europe, so they have to handle that, they have to communicate with all those, those partners from Spain to UK or wherever they're sitting. So they start as a two or three person startup and they have to, to even in their, their product research and development phase, they have to be very international. So you cannot sit here in Graz and just uh, traveling from Andrés to Liebenau, you have to think worldwide. <laughs> Or a good example is U-Sound, the company started here in, in Graz uh, in the incubator uh, four years ago, I think. So if you, they are doing, they are developing speaker technology based on MEMS technology. So maybe next year you can buy the first smartphones who have speakers, MEMS speakers from U-Sound uh, in their cases. Uh, uh, I think next year they, maybe they can be in market. But the thing is, when you look at the company now, there are two found, two, three founders, two are Italians, one is in Austria, they have their headquarters in Graz, they have offices in Vienna, in San Francisco, in Shanghai, in Shenzhen. Uh, interesting, they are producing here in Europe and their customers are in China. So uh, they're producing here in, I think in Corinthia and in Asturia. The MEM speaker, so the customers sitting in China, companies like those who are building these devices are their customers and their users are worldwide. So they have to understand how the users are uh, using their products, whether they're sitting in Russia or in the United States or in, 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 in Spain. Uh, so that's, if you build up company based on innovation, you are from the very first beginning confronted with, with the, the point that you have to communicate with partners all over the world, that you have to understand partners all over the world, you have to understand how the customer in China is uh, thinking, you have to understand uh, how you get uh, employees in Shenzhen or in Shanghai, so that's really important. It, I think the university is the best place to train this, this way of thinking. So, I mean, I think as you are uh, in this lecture, you are very in internationally from your mindset, uh, but your university can help you of training this. For, uh, just take this example because uh, we had on, on Monday, uh, we had the kickoff of this European University Alliance uh, project. So University of Graz is uh, one of the first universities uh, who are in this new European University Alliances. And we built up uh, a team of seven universities and entrepreneurship is also a part of this project. So we will try to build a, a entrepreneurship programs for students over all these university campuses. So I, I'm really looking forward to that project uh, uh, because our goal is that when you study here in Graz, you will, can use lectures in Granada, in Vilnius, in Bergen, 
or use startup programs all over Europe. So this is where the university can help. Or also we try to train our students uh, to, to think internationally uh, with programs like the Transatlantic Entrepreneurship Academy. Maybe you heard about that. Now it's open. You can apply for the TEA program. And basically the program is that we, we, are, we are try to get 20 students from Graz and our partner university, Mokia State University, they are also looking for 20 students and bring them together two weeks, one week in Mokia, one week in Graz. And they're working really intensive on developing innovation and, and, and startup projects, basically. It's, it's an, I would call it an innovation boot camp. You learn how you develop disruptive innovation from the scratch, uh, from crazy ideas to products in, in two weeks, basically. And you learn how to work together with colleagues from, from the other side of the Atlantic looks like that. This is a picture from last year's uh, or this March 2019 week in Montreal. We also visit New York and a lot of companies there. And this is a group of very motivated uh, and, and uh, really good, a cool group of students. Um, and what we try to do is that you learn to develop innovation projects, how to do innovation projects really hands on. Uh, but besides to learn how to start a company, you should, I think it's very important to learn how to cooperate on an international level, to understand different cultures. It's always interesting to see how the culture of students at Montclair State University is different from students here from Graz. And it's not everything based on the, the points that we can drink alcohol earlier in the life than the other ones. Uh, but it's really, interesting to understand the different culture to understand also global markets you get input from the colleagues from the united states how the market there is the colleagues from montclair they they are really excited to learn how european people are thinking about entrepreneurship what's going on here in graz and austria uh, and you have to to handle all those different uh, mindsets and cultures be because we always mix together them uh, in teams american students together in teams and they have to work two weeks together very intensively they have to work we between the two weeks uh, a remote together where Skype or whatever they they use so they have to learn how can I collaborate with a business partner uh, in another continent uh, via uh, tools I have nowadays also interesting and also learn to build not, not learn but also build networks most of we have now we have, I think it's the fourth time we, we now organize the TA and there are a lot of connections between Montclair and Graz, uh, which are very stable. They are visiting them, they are thinking about starting projects together. So it's a good way to build network, to learn how to build networks and build networks because networks is everything, uh, very important foundation for every entrepreneur. And you have to, to very important is also to understand how, how, how you build up networks is uh, you have to find the right partner on the other side, for example, these are Jason and Ian, our, our like-minded friends on Montclair State University campus. And uh, we built this program, we did it first time, then we made like a uh, one week session here in Styria, drinking some glasses of wine and uh, reorganized all the stuff and that's really the, the foundation of our of our work because we know each other as person we like we see that we have the same mindsets and this is this is something also you, you have to do as an entrepreneur when you work together with partners all over the world you can do it all via skype or whatever you, uh, you need but sometimes you need a glass of wine to build up these relationships yeah, and then you, uh, you have everything together. Really important and really hard point is that you have to team up really with the best. Uh, and that's not so easy because when you start a, a startup, you maybe a team of two founders, you need the first employee, a second employee. And it's really important to carefully choose the employee because when you do 
founders come and you, you have your first employee, you expand your company, uh, like it's like Knapp will employ thousand employees in one time. <laughs> so because, uh, and you have to really look about, look to find the really best one, not the first one who will uh, work for you. And it's, it's difficult because uh, you don't have money to pay them, you don't have any resources, infrastructure maybe, but you need really the best one. And then that's, that's a hard thing for every startup. And if you uh, have an employee, you see, you see that's not the best one, you have uh, to make also a hard decision to, to, to end up the, the relationship. So, but it's, it's the thing which, yeah, which uh, decides whether you're success, successful or not. And the thing is, you need different, different qualifications in the team, like this, I think, rather successful company, which is on the picture, it's a, the team of Microsoft in the first years, I don't know exactly when it was made, the pictures, but you need uh, always a uh, different uh, skill set in the company, which you, of course, you need the know-how, you need something who really knows the stuff, so you need the nerd, who, who really knows uh, the, all the technique and all, you need someone who organize and you need the, 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 someone who is standing on the stage and sells your company to the audience. So you see, you don't, you don't, you don't find a person who is everything in one person, so you have to have a team and you have to be very careful to, to choose your team members. But definitely you need, uh, all those, all those qualifications, and you don't need three people who likes to stay on stage. But because if I'm standing on stage and making a pitch in for in front of investors, it would be good that at the office someone is sitting and and uh, is uh, coding the thing I sell to the investors. So and you need someone who loves to organize and and make all those Excel sheets and so on. So. That's really important and you need, and that's something you have to build, you need something like a team spirit because it's hard, you have to work a lot, you cannot pay uh, like, uh, like, uh, like, like ABL or Knapp or all those companies. Uh, so you need the team spirit, it's like, like I always find out in, when I visit Daniel at the office of, of uh, uh, Bike Citizens, uh, you, when you enter the office, you, okay, you feel that uh, everyone is passionate on their product, on, on bicycling, on cycling in the, in the city, and you feel that somehow, so they're all highly motivated, and that's something uh, which you have to build up carefully. It's just also one of the main uh, things that the founder has to do, to choose the team members and, and try to build up the, the spirit. It, it's, I mean, you. There are no manuals for how to build a team spirit and you make it like a checklist, it's something you have to, to feel and, and to react when it's going in the wrong direction. So, but that can uh, be uh, the, one of the important points on the way of being successful. Sometimes you, you find your team also, you found a company uh, with your friends from your childhood, that's also a possibility. The thing is, which I all see here is, it's, it's a little bit dangerous because in that case, it's more important to, to bring it on a formal basis and from the very beginning because the point is, okay, I know my friends since kindergarten, we know each other, we know what we want. We don't have to write it down in some contract, but that could be uh, lead to a bad outcome. So also when you make a company for best friends, you know them from forever, you do everything together, please write down uh, some, in some formal form, what everyone brings into the company, how you will be divided when, if someone wants to leave the company, all those boring stuff, which you think this should be the, the work of the students on the, uh, law faculty, but you have just take a piece of paper, write it down the, the, in bullet points, uh, as always, then for a glass of wine, and then write it down <laughs> and, and sign it. So that's 
also for the bad times, hopefully you don't need it, but if you are in troubles and, and you do not agree uh, each other, just take the, take the sheet of paper and say, okay, if it not works out, we can split up the company without troubles because we had this contract. So very important also in, in this situation where you start your company with your best friend, you know your friends since, as I said, from kindergarten. Yeah, and of course, when you start a company, it's also important to understand the rules and, and the frameworks on international markets. What do I mean with that is, uh, I just grabbed some examples of, of companies who started here in Graz, for example, CSD Labs. They uh, develop an algorithm to analyze audio signals and I found out that it's very helpful to use it in a medical situation. Uh, you take, they take a signal from an uh, electronic stethoscope and they find out for newborns, uh, every newborn, for example in Austria, has to be analyzed in the first days uh, whether there is a problem with their heartbeat and normal is done by the by the doctor and the hearing, and it's depending on the experience whether you found out there is a problem with this heart murmur or not. Uh, and they developed a, a software which do this automatically in very high quality way. And uh, the point is that they've, okay, they thought, okay, we're sitting here in Graz, we're making this nice software, where's the best place to start this? And they decided to have a make a market in entry in America, in the United States, and also incorporated in Canada because they then found out that they're the best situation for them to go make the first steps there. So they, they know the situation in the market, they analyzed it, they had some connections to, to university clinics in the United States and uh, now the situation is that they are headquartered in Graz, they developed their product in Graz, but they, and they had the market entry in the United States. So that's, that's, that's because they they didn't make it by accident, so it's like, oh, we have a nice product, let's start it in Graz, but they analyzed it and, and, and uh, talked a lot of with the market and decided to do this in the, yeah, the hard way to, to go in the United States. It was easier for them to find investors there. Uh, they had in any way to, to get the, all these certifications to go on the market there, so they decided to do it uh, there. So that's because they know what's going on in the market. Also, another example, I, I like the company ImagoDuck. They are, I would say, one of the fastest growing company uh, I ever uh, supported from the beginning. Uh, here in Graz, ImagoDuck, they developed an electronic labeling solution for supermarkets, for example. They developed these uh, labels based on e-papers and start to, s to, to sell it to like media market or so. And they understand the market and this, they saw, okay, that's not enough to just put a label on the shelf. They have to develop the whole ecosystem around that, like the uh, software around. Now they are teaming up with payment companies so that they have, you have with the label the whole payment solution for the, for the customer. You can go to the supermarket, take your product, pay with your smartphone, with information you get on the label. So the thing is that they really understand what's going on, that they are good in their technology, but they're not they focused on nerdy technology. They, they speak with the market and now they develop a whole ecosystem for this, for this retail market and have now a platform technology and they're really selling hundreds or millions of, of their label worldwide because they are delivering a, a solution which solves a lot of problems for these offline retail shops who have troubles, how can they integrate their offline shop with the online uh, world? How can they solve problems like putting the right price on the label without uh, switching the paper labels? Uh, how, how can they um, synchronize online and offline prices? And, and, and those are pains for this, for this, uh, for this uh, market and they, they solve these pains. Because they, there's an interesting team, uh, Michael and Andreas. Michael is, is an 
was from the boss of Andreas, they did a consulting company for retail uh, chains, and it was all the same problem they, their customer told them with those labels. And so they decided to start a company uh, and has the, the, the young technology power uh, house, Andreas and Michael, the experienced uh, uh, man in the industry who knows everything that's going on in the retail industry. And it was good to, to combine those together. They are on the, on the same level from the very first beginning, talk from the same level. Uh, they decided to get rid of this boss and employee situation and now they started coming up. They are really very successful. So that's because they know what's going on around in the world. They're not just looking on, uh, on, a, on a single situation, for example, here in Graz. They, they're looking from Nebraska to Moscow, what's going on in the retail market. They have uh, open minds to the, to the uh, voices of the customer and they understand what they have to deliver. That's really important. And the last point is uh, if you are an entrepreneur, uh, you have, of course, you have to be really good in your in your domain, to be an expert, to know what's going on in the finances and so on. But nearly every single successful startup I helped as a mentor or or, or uh, somehow there was someone in the team who was like a little bit crazy, I would say. So that's that's something which every successful uh, company I saw has has in common is that there is one crazy guy or girl in, in, the, in, the, in the founding team. So because it's, it's, of course, it's fun if you have some crazy in the team, but like, uh, for example, Eric, I mean, uh, is, is uh, an interesting man. He developed uh, software for simulation of product, for product development, he developed software that helps companies like Fisher's Key in that case to develop uh, products faster. And he, he put it as open source uh, on the market and, and everyone said, hey, can I put this high class software open source on the market? But he said, okay, I understand my customer and uh, I know that they will pay for services putting around those uh, open source uh, software. And the thing is when you talk with him, he's, he's that deep in his topic that you think, oh man, he's, he's, like, he's really crazy. But uh, he knows every single uh, thing he has to know in his market. And that's what makes him successful because he's, he's better than every other one in his field. Now he's working on a new project which <coughs> develop a software based on neural networks which do all those uh, prototyping without really prototyping, so he cuts this prototyping process into it on, on based on neural network software, so that you just reduce from like ten prototypes to two prototype cycles. The other one you you make on silico or, or on the on the computer. So because he's he's that deep in the topics, he's like when you talk with him, he's a little bit crazy, but but that's nice. That's also like. When I first had my first meeting with, with Daniel from Bike Citizens, he told me his big vision, his plan with how he can revolutionize the way uh, urban cyclists will, uh, will, will use the city as their playing ground and, and put this, showed me Excel sheets with numbers and said, oh man, this guy is really <laughs> not really normal. And, and I thought then, okay, you have to, to give that type of person a, a chance because he's, he's, that, he, he's so deep in his topic, he's so passionate about cycling and, and cycling in city and he, and I, he knows better than every other one who, what, what, what the need of, of the market and the cyclist is and, and most of the time and that, that craziness also makes that, uh, that's an important point, uh, if you start a, a company as, as an entrepreneur, especially in Austria, and you talk to 10 people, nine people will say, oh, that will not work. You see, don't see this problem and that problem and this problem, and you don't have customer, you don't have money, just uh, uh, stop it and, and take a job at Siemens. And you, you have to be a little bit crazy to, to, to uh, 
withstand all those those uh, negative uh, people and because everybody knows everything better and if you are like a normal person okay I talked to five smart people and four of them said that bullshit maybe it's not the best idea to start a company but if you like Daniel say Bernard I will convince you that this is the right uh, thing and and I will show it to you and I know that it will work so it's a right mixture of being a little bit crazy but not that totally crazy that you cannot handle your normal life so <laughs> that's really important but I think you need that this power of craziness or as, as a really uh, important investor says uh, he invests he loves to invest in startups who really believes totally unreasonable that their idea is working so that's that's also the like Herman House is one of the really big names in investing in startups he the, the founder of the Cambridge uh, startup uh, phenomenon and he systematically looks uh, where you can find teams where there's some craziness in it because you do not invest in the normal uh, team where everybody is like normal. So that's, that. I think that's really important. Animex Fund works with slightly crazy people. Yeah, to sum it up, uh, why did I talk about uh, it's all about people because when you start, when it, being an entrepreneur, it's you have to handle people in different roles you have founders you have co-founders you have employees mentors investors corporation partners fam you have a family and it's not about uh, lines of code or, or prototypes or, or business model it's about the people you have to handle all those situations you have to find out who are the best ones I can work with you have to handle situations where different people are not so happy together so that's why I say at the end it's, it's all about people because there are so different people you need to, to pull together uh, to be successful. And, and it's about people and therefore it's about networks and collaboration and cooperation and, and you have to work together. You have to create project together and it starts here in Graz. You see that you have to go over your single office into the ecosystems and it's also at the end it's about collaboration and networks on the, on the same worldwide level yeah that's because it's all about people and at the end I have some oh it's time is running at the end I have some offers for you if you are ready to start just the motivation this was uh, 2011 uh, the first first uh, the uh, first point where, where a company called My Sugar was, was on stage. This was a startup weekend. This was the, the early version of the Pioneers Festival. That's just how you feel when you start a company. This was 2011. I think they started the company 2010 or so. Uh, and I think one and a half year ago, 2018, they sold the company to Roche for some three digit million amount of money. Uh, and they represent I think uh, like Frederick uh, and, and his co-founder, they represent everything I told you about uh, about people in Europe. They're really passionate and they're really into their topics and they're so happy of building something which is really worth something. And as a side effect, now they earned a lot of money and now they invested back into the community in new startups. So it's really perfect to see those those people on the stage. And if you are now ready to start your own company, I have some last minute offers for you to, to step into the community. Uh, today, seven o'clock, uh, for, especially for the female founders, there's the start of Fritz, special edition, woman edition. Uh, it's a monthly meetup, start of Fritz's monthly meetup for the startup ecosystem here in Graz every third Thursday of every month, normally in Spaceland, in the co-working space today in a special location in the Halle X in the Reininghausgründe. Special therefore because after that event it will be disrupted. So uh, the last event in this Halle X. So if you want to join the startup community today, uh, you can use the chance on Startup Fritzer. And another uh, event for, for female <coughs> founders on 15th of November, there's the first female founders conference here in Graz. Uh, 
lead the day, shape tomorrow is the motto. Uh, I think they will have a nice setup of, of speakers uh, in the Meerschein Schlössel. Uh, so uh, when you go to the website, femalefounders.com, I think I will send you the link if you are interested. If you have already a startup idea, uh, the end of November, there will be a lovely event, the Startup Playground, which are three days where you can develop your idea with mentors and, and partners in a very hands-on uh, setting in the Safeland co-working space. Uh, I will also be there as a, as a mentor. You can go there with an idea, you can pitch your idea, you can find co-founders and work nearly 24 hours for three days from 22nd of November to 24th and also work hard, play hard. There will also be some parties which un interrupts the working sessions. So it's really nice setup to really go in deep into your, your idea. So, and there's a very f last uh, slide. I have also uh, invited another one who really knows, was really successful as an entrepreneur, and I will give him the right of the last words. Okay, as in every uh, part of our life, if you don't love it, you will fail. Uh, so uh, Steve, uh, I think he, he knows what he's doing. He was, I think, very successful, and I also, this, this nice video, uh, I downloaded from YouTube. If you want to follow the link, there are a lot of videos from, from Steve Jobs, but I, I like that, uh, that uh, message of this video. So if you uh, have any further question, we discuss, can discuss it now. Uh, uh, we, you can also write me an email. You can send me an email if you want now to start your own company. Uh, or if you have any question, uh, related to entrepreneurship startups here in university. If I can give you some context to organizations I mentioned here or startups I mentioned here, so feel free to send an email or, yeah. And I will be happy if like at least 50% out of the audience will start a company <laughs> during the next two years. So that's my challenge. I will monitor that. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I talked now one and a half hour without letting you ask questions. That's uh, sorry for that. You don't interrupt it. <laughs> so thank you for listening. <laughs>